right, let's turn in our Bibles. Uh, what better place to start a study of Romans than Acts chapter number 2? We are going to be studying, Lord willing, on Thursday nights and Sunday nights throughout the fall, the Bible book of Romans. We are going to try between now and December to get through the first five chapters, but I have no confidence that we will be able to do so because the book is just loaded. If you need to look in the uh, index or table of contents uh, for your Bible, uh, you're welcome to, but your Bible runs as follows. Malachi, the last of the Old Testament writers and prophets, pronouncing God's severe displeasure against the nation of Israel for their idolatry and their apostasy. And then God has nothing more to say to man for 400 years. They're called the silent centuries. And for those 400 years, God, God uh, offers man no scripture. And then we, we open up with Matthew, the, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have four wonderful gospels about his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension back up into heaven. And then the book of Acts tells how people who were eyewitnesses of that death, burial, and resurrection and who believed on him as Savior from their hearts went everywhere preaching the word and established in one place and then another and then another, uh, what is known in Scripture as the New Testament church, the body of Christ, the the fellowship of all believers in in one with Jesus Christ as the head. And so if if you think uh, think about it, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, these, these books, we call them gospels, we call them prophets, but they are primarily historical documents telling us what happened. And aren't you glad we have them? But the first book that God gives you to tell you what you are supposed to believe and how you are supposed to live as a Christian is the book of Romans. John tells us what Jesus did so we could be Christians. Acts tells us how people were made or how they became Christians Romans tells us what it means to be a Christian and how we are to conduct ourselves if we claim the name of Christ or profess to be Christians. And so it's it's in the right place in your Bible as the first of the teaching letters and teaching epistles to the church. In Romans, we have the foundation of true doctrinal teaching for the church. In Romans, we have a concise, direct presentation of what Christians are supposed to believe and what Christians are supposed to teach. The book of Romans is well-placed, as we said at the start of the epistles. It lays the foundations in a systematic way of man's relations with God before saving grace and of man's relations to God in Christ after He receives salvation by grace. And we'll break that down a little more fully in just a little bit. Job asked a question long, long, long time ago. How shall man be just with God? Romans answers that question. And so we'll see that in the early chapters of the book. Now, look at Acts chapter 2. And the Bible says in verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. That's a Jewish feast day. It happened every year, but this year, uh, some big happenings on a day that happened. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There's no wind. There's a sound like the sound a rushing mighty wind would make, if there was a rushing mighty wind. Man, there's so many things taught and preached and sung about in our churches that are supposed to be in the Bible and they're not. So they heard this sound, rushing mighty wind. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. Now what what would you rather experience? Fire or something that looked like fire? Okay, these men are not receiving a baptism of fire or with fire or by fire. 
There isn't any fire there. There are cloven tongues that look like the flames of fire. So the tongue's not this way sticking out of the mouth. It's sticking up and down like a, like a flame. would. If you, if you saw a flame, that's what it would look like. But they, these were tongues uh, like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So if you came here tonight to try and get the baptism of fire, that's something you don't want. That's what happens to lost people when they get to hell, according to the Bible. And if you came here tonight hoping to hear the sound of a rushing mighty wind, you might, but it would be very unusual circumstances and would probably be some disaster rather than some working of God. And if you came here tonight to speak with other tongues, we'll get, we'll get uh, on with this in just a second, but let me ask you something. If you don't use the language you know to tell people about Jesus, why would he give you two or three more languages? <laughs> yeah, I, did. Well, I sure wish I could speak in unknown tongues. Why don't you use the known one and, and try that one out? There, that, that, would, that would help to speak up for the Lord. All right, so verse number five. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem. doesn't say that, they, that it was their place of residence, but they were dwelling there. Uh, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. You say, what do you think that means? That if there was a nation under heaven on this day of Pentecost, there were people from that nation in Jerusalem on that day. That's what it says. Now, when this was noised abroad, what happened in the upper room, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So, uh, this isn't our subject tonight, but just maybe this will help you, and, and I hope it does. What does it mean to speak in tongues? It doesn't mean to babble incoherently or uncontrollably. It means to speak to people in a language you don't know, but a language which they do know. That, according to the Bible, that's, that's what's happening. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? How about that? So you got 120 believers in this upper room, whether, whether 120 went out and began to witness, or whether the uh, 12 went out and began to preach, and the others were there um, giving out gospel tracts, which weren't invented yet, or holding scripture signs, which... Uh, Anyway, the Word of God is being proclaimed by people from every nation, uh, two people from every nation under heaven, by people who were all of one nation, and it was a supernatural work of God so that he could jump start the worldwide proclamation of the gospel. That's what it was for. Now, it's sad that people have for selfish reasons or carnal reasons or because they haven't been taught properly, isn't it sad that people have reduced what they call speaking in tongues to something as selfish or as relatively useless as having some sort of exciting experience in a church service when you see the great and noble purpose for which God gave the gift of tongues as it is used in the Bible. Whenever we get away from doing things God's way, we end up weakening or cheapening whatever it is we're doing because uh, if we do things the way God wants them done, they're always better than if we just do something our own way. Okay, we've we, we got to get to Romans here tonight. Verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in, in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Verse 14 Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. And he begins to preach. And he says in verse number 21, 
It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God. Verse 22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved to God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So what has Peter preached? The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, And he has told his audience, if they will call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. That's what you preach, I hope. That's what Paul preached after he got saved. That's what every Christian gospel preacher preaches. If you want to have everlasting life, call on the Lord who died and was buried and rose again. There it is, the very first Sermon preached after the coming of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says, verse number 41, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. They weren't baptized before they gladly received the word. They weren't baptized as a substitute for gladly receiving the word. They gladly received the word and then they were baptized. That will be repeated in the case of everyone whose whose record of salvation is given in the Bible. If God had ever changed to doing something else, like baptizing you first so you could become a believer, or not baptizing you after you became a believer, he would have said so. But he didn't say so. So we're going to stay with what God started until God tells us to stop it. We're going to preach the gospel. People who believe will baptize them. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now stop for a minute. Or, or, no, no, don't stop. <laughs> don't stop for a minute. Verse 47. Uh, Praising God, having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Okay. So they, they heard the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believed it. They were baptized. And God says two things about them. They were saved, and they were added to the church. Okay? Now, here's the situation you have. They were added to the church, but there was no building. They were added to the church, but there was no structured uh, hierarchy of Elders, bishops, deacons, pastors, they're saved. 120 are saved, now there's 3,120 saved. And then daily after that, people keep getting saved. But the day of Pentecost is the central point in a feast, running the better part of a week, plus or minus a few days. And now these people from every nation under heaven are going to go back home. They're going to go home saved. They're going to go home baptized members of the church. And they're going to go home to places without pastors and without church buildings. People have different theories on the church. We don't like theories. We like to just go with what the Bible says. 3,000 were added to the church. Nobody joined anything. God added saved people to his church. And those saved people, they fellowship together with other saved people because that's what saved people do. And then they went home to every nation under heaven. What a great head start for the gospel. What a very slow and difficult and dangerous start for Christianity. So what, what, what do you mean? Well, let, let's say a tenth of these people live in Jerusalem full time. So 27 people are going home having been saved who don't know what to do next. They say, well, they can just read it in their New Testament. But there isn't one. Well, why didn't they give them one to take home? Because it won't be written for a few decades. See, here, here's why you have to appreciate the Bible more than you do. 
If we knocked on your door this week or met you on a street corner while we were preaching this week or someone witnessed you on your job this week and you heard the gospel and you got saved and there was no church for you to go to and there was no pastor to teach you and there was no New Testament for you to read to tell you what to do, what would you do? What would you know to do? How would you know to do it? So, we have 16 chapters of Romans telling us why we weren't saved, why we had to be saved, what God did so we could get saved, what happened when we were saved, what is the result of being saved, and what God expects of us now that we're saved And the people that got saved in Acts chapter 2 didn't have any of that. We shouldn't live like we don't have any of that. All right, so you're saved. All over Volusia County, there are thousands of people who are saved. Do you know why they live like they do? Because you can't find out how to live the Christian life on Facebook. And you can't find out how to live the Christian life watching ESPN. And you can't figure out how to live the Christian life by playing games on your phone. God gave you some letters of instruction to teach you and show you how to live the Christian life. What a sad thing that people who have the New Testament are still living like they don't. Now, if you got saved in Acts 2 and you went home to Rome... It would be understandable if you didn't know anything but how to get saved because you don't know anything but how to get saved. But it's pretty sad if you live in Deland, Florida and you got saved 22 years ago and you still don't know anything but how you got saved. That's why we have books like Romans and Galatians and Ephesians so we don't have to be saved but there's no indication of it to anyone anywhere. There's some teaching involved. Okay, so some people got saved at Jerusalem and went home to Rome. Now, I want you to think about, uh, 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 just, just bear this in mind a little bit, because it'll, it'll help you to be a witness in your town, at the events in your area, someday on a foreign field. While the condition of Judaism at the time of Acts 2, was such as to cause the name of God to be blasphemed among the Gentiles. That's Romans 2.24. Romans 2.24 says the Gentiles want nothing to do with the God of the Jews because of the way the Jews live. That's bad. That's really bad. This apostasy, however, actually served to help when the gospel was first proclaimed. Think of any church or region today where the name of God is used, but where his word and ways are held in contempt. The crowds will be huge. You know why there's great big giant crowds at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost? Because it's a holiday. It's a celebration. It's an outdoor catfish festival. It's a bluegrass festival. It's an antique car show. It's a place to go and wander around and look for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If it was holiness unto the Lord, there wouldn't be a lot of people there. So while God's disgusted with what the Jews have done to his name and his temple and his, and his feast days... He looks down and says, here's the one place on earth where I have the, have the best opportunity to get the gospel to the world in 24 hours. And so he does. Now think of those places, by contrast, where righteousness and holiness are elevated and observe how few people are in attendance there. So God didn't deliver his word in, a, in the upper room. He sent them out of the upper room to deliver his word to the multitudes out there on the streets in the day of Pentecost. 
So, as we said, when we read Malachi through John, we have no reason to doubt that the annual Pentecostal gathering at Jerusalem was more of a carnival than a time of worship. If the holy temple was filled with money changers, remember? It is easy to picture the streets crammed with peddlers and vendors selling their food and their drink and their junk and their glow-in-the-dark necklaces and their inflatable Santa Clauses on a stick and calling out to passers-by to waste their substance on riotous living. They're frying corn. They're grilling hamburgers. They're, I mean, it's, it's a big deal, man. The lewd women of Proverbs 8 would have been abundant, as would the young revelers willing to enter the doors of death for a moment's pleasure. The curious and cunning, the bored and amazed, the family and the vagrant, all jostling together in the streets in a vain pursuit of the satisfaction which moves like a mirage always just out of reach. It's tailgating at the college football game. It's infielding and RVing at the Daytona 500. It's the holiday parade in downtown Orlando. It's just a big mob of people hoping this one's going to be more fun than the last one. There were pauses throughout the day for times of ritual and prayer, but these activities would be ignored by the crowds. It was Mardi Gras, it was Christmas, it was college football, it was the Harvest Festival, noise, adventure, lust, chance, the trip of a lifetime. It was into this chaos and revelry that men filled with the Holy Ghost rushed from an upper room and God's power caused all activity to cease while men from every nation under heaven heard in their language the wonderful work wrought by God for the payment of their sins and the saving of their souls. What a scene. Don't underestimate the power of the Holy Ghost on men and women who have given up everything in this world to follow Jesus. The heathen, the pagan, the profane and blasphemous mob gathered in Jerusalem heard of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and thousands were converted. Praise the Lord. What good does it do? Read your Bible. While we would never suggest in any way the doing of evil that good may come, Romans 3, eight, none would argue that among that multitude, some men and women of Rome went home from their adventure having Jesus Christ in their hearts, and others returned to tell of what they had seen and heard, even if they had not believed it. The gospel went to Rome in the mouths of people who really knew nothing other than the gospel. And that was enough for a church to be established before Paul or an apostle ever got there. So you're not part of the church if you learn all the doctrines. You're, not part, of the, you learn, you're part of the church if you get saved. And the church is an assembly, a gathering of saved people. All right, come to Acts chapter 8 and 1 Peter chapter 1. Acts chapter 8. Time goes by as it tends to do. A year later, there are thousands and thousands of saved people. And the Jewish power structure, the swamp at Jerusalem, was upset about it. And the Bible says in Acts 8 and verse 1, And Saul, who would later become Paul, was consenting unto his death, that's Stephen's death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. They, they stayed to hold the fort. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house, and hauling men and women committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad 
went everywhere preaching the word. Now up to this time, everyone you read about getting saved in Acts, that is that is specified, appears to be Jews in and around Jerusalem. Now they're being driven out everywhere. When Peter picks up his pen some years later, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 1 says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. What happened to them? Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace be multiplied. In Acts 8, they're scattered and they go everywhere preaching the word. A few years later, Peter writes, and there are people everywhere that letter will be carried and read who have had the Holy Spirit regenerate them because of their faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. So the Lord used a carnival to get the gospel out. And then the Lord used persecution to get the instruction out. It's best to just let God have his way and get up every day and serve the Lord and not trying to figure out what's happening with the government or the churches or the denominations or the currency or the United Nations because what you might think is a total disaster might be the perfect will of God to get his word and his teaching where it needs to be. Just just a thought. All right, now look at Acts 13. Some were scattered. They went everywhere preaching the word. People got saved. Churches are being established. Now it's time to send men to instruct and to build up, to strengthen, and to clarify. Acts 13.1 Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, that's a Jewish man, and Simeon that was called Niger, Niger means black, and Lucius of Cyrene, that's an African, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, there's a European. So you know what you have in Acts 13, 1? Save people. Now, in the world, you'd have white people and black people and brown people and Jewish people and Gentile people, but in Christ, you have saved people. And there they are in church, in verse number 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed from Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. You notice who the Holy Ghost sends out? People that a church can put their hands on. He doesn't grab freelancers who aren't in a church. He doesn't grab people who think they don't need it. Why would he send somebody who doesn't think they need a church to start a church? Why would he send somebody who has, has no respect for a pastor to be a pastor? <laughs> People are weird, man. They're so they just they, well, they're special. There's a Bible, and then there's me. And so, so away they went, and they they went out there to establish these churches. All right. Um, having said that, having read those verses. It is uncertain as to when those scattered from Jerusalem first reached Rome to preach and teach. Those who assert that Peter founded the church at Rome have no shred of evidence to support their view. The book of Acts surely would have mentioned it as it follows Peter very closely. Others say it was a joint effort of Peter and Paul. That verse doesn't have half a verse of scripture to support it. It's quite possible the church at Rome began with those converts who returned from Jerusalem, rejoicing together in their common faith in Christ, crucified and risen, and telling others what they had seen, heard, and experienced. What they lacked in knowledge would be countered by the joy that was theirs, as the case of the Ethiopian in Acts 8 would suggest. He got saved and went on his way rejoicing. 
And Philip saw him no more. But somebody's taken the good news of the gospel down there into Ethiopia. This we know. Christ established his church in Rome when Roman power was at its height. Didn't stop God. Most of the world was under the control of Roman emperors. It didn't stop the Holy Ghost. Almost all countries had been reduced to the condition of provinces or were subject kingdoms governed in subordination to the Roman emperor or senate. Thus it was the great center of communication, commerce, wealth, influence, civil power, and military might. It didn't stop the gospel. It's hard for us. If if you go to school these days, if you get any history at all, it's not much, and it's not well taught. And so, here's what we think. White men landed. A lot of white men landed. They took the land from the Indians or the natives. And then... We got what we have today. Well, yeah, kind of, but that's a short telling of 500 years. 400 years, 400 years is a long time. It's a long time. What you had is you had a group that moved into a place where there were many, 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 many different tribes or nations or, or empires... And over centuries, they grew in power and took this one over and then this one over and then this one over until three or four hundred years later, like it or not, your life is run almost entirely by a handful of people in Washington, New York, and Los Angeles. Your news, your information, your education, your entertainment, your communication is dominated, but that took hundreds of years. That's the Roman Empire. It wasn't, okay, Babylon, next page, (laughs) Persia, next page, Greece, next page, Rome. These are centuries. But by the time you are reading in the New Testament, the Roman Empire has completely absorbed the Pecots and the Cherokee and the Huron and the... You understand what we're saying? Nation, all these little nations, but this one big one swallowed them all up and it controls and it runs everything. And God said, I don't care. I'll send my gospel right into the middle of its headquarters and they don't have to take over the government. They just have to tell people I died and was buried and rose again. And people will get saved, and I'll have a church. And those people will tell others, and we'll have more churches, and more churches, and more churches. And that's what God put Christians in the world to do. Not go to Rome and assassinate Caesar. Not go to Rome and make the soldiers stop wearing funny hats and skirts. Go there and tell people about Jesus. Let the world be the world. It it will be till Christ gets back. Let let the government do what the government does. Go preach the gospel. And and they did. And people got saved. Now, as... um, That's just so much to say all at one time. Christ established his church. Roman power was at its height. And the kingdoms were subject to him, uh, or to, to Rome... As the gospel spread outward from Jerusalem, it was Paul whose journeys brought him ever nearer to this great city. As the Holy Spirit led him from Antioch to Ephesus, from there to Macedon, then to Athens, then to Corinth, it became his goal to visit Rome. In Acts 19.21, Acts 19.21, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit... When he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. Well, he did, but not the way he expected. At the time he expressed this longing, he was going into Greece. Circumstances presented him for reaching Rome. It was then necessary for him to return to Judea to deliver aid from the Christians in Macedonia and Achaia to those in Jerusalem. 
Once this was done, he set his heart toward Rome, writing to the church there to inform them of his desire to visit. We'll get that in Acts 1, or, uh, Romans 1, 10 to 13, and Romans 15, 23 to 28. He started the letter saying, I want to come see you, I just can't get there. He ended the letter saying, I want to come see you, I just can't get there. By the time he got there, he was in chains on his way to execution. So he sure didn't build that church. It was there waiting for him when he got there. If the gospel starts with Paul, and you've got to have Paul to get the gospel, how do you explain the church at Rome? Now let's talk about the place where these Christians established a church with not much to go on, but their salvation, their dedication to God and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Do you know that until the railroad, until the railroad, no one ever traveled any faster than Adam could travel? Something to think about. With the invention of electricity, the railroad and then electricity, the world changed into something it had never been before. Up till then, it was what it had always been. Now, why do I say that? Because we tend to think that back here in Bible times, it was sort of a different universe. It was a different world. People were so dramatically different that you couldn't possibly do now what they did then. Why not? People travel faster and they're able to stay up later and live more comfortably, but you strip that away, what's different? Food, clothes, marriage, giving in marriage, buying, selling, building, planting, that's what Jesus, that's all people do, and then the flood comes and takes them all away. So think about Rome, the great mighty Rome, and while you're thinking about it, maybe you can think about, I don't know, Miami, Jacksonville, Tampa, your hometown. The church at Rome was an assembly of believers surrounded by a city of two million people, half of whom were citizens and half of whom were slaves. Those who held power and influence were a very small minority. The opportunity for social or economic advancement was almost non-existent. Slaves begat slaves and masters begat masters and rarely, if ever, did one escape the status into which they were born. Now you tell me what's changed. Not much so far. The city, as all cities are, was filled with a great many leeches or those who had come to seek adventure and fortune in the world's greatest city and, and busted. So vast multitudes lived on money taken by the government from the people who worked for it and given to the people who didn't. Come on, people, nothing's changed. God's not asking you to go preach the gospel in Mars. He's asking you to go preach to men on the earth in towns like towns have always been. The city was full of all the iniquity and evils, both outward and covert, that one finds and has ever found where men are assembled in such large numbers. Look at Isaiah chapter 5. We'll throw some scripture in here tonight. Isaiah chapter 5. Living on a farm won't guarantee you get saved, and living in a high-rise condo doesn't guarantee you'll die lost. But it's easier to find God when you can see the sun come up in the morning than when you live in a cave. Yeah. Isaiah 5 and verse number 8. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. 
You know why that is? People are sinners. The more sinners you cram together into one place, the more sin you're going to have. That's just, that's just how it goes. All right, because it was the seat of government and held the most advanced innovation and technology of its day, Rome naturally attracted many persons from the conquered provinces, and among these were a large number of Jews. Associated with these would be Gentile proselytes to the Hebrew religion. In a city and nation where the secular had almost completely driven out the holy, that's Romans 1, and where idols and gods of every sort were revered, Romans 1, Judaism's offer of one true God and its rejection of images would have drawn to it many who liked to retain God in their knowledge. How could Christianity ever prosper in a city full of idols and idolatry because the people who have not thrown God out of their heart know this isn't God? Look at Romans 1. Come there, we'll spend (laughs) weeks, maybe months in Romans 1. But turn there just for a minute. Tell me how this differs from your town. I know, and I'll tell you in in a minute, but we'll see if you can can get it first. Verse 21, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. So what did they do? They didn't want God, one true God, so they made images of men, and beasts, and birds, and creeping things. Now what's different between that day and your day? Well, in your day, your tax money is spent on images of things that aren't images of anything. They're just total pieces of junk stacked on each other all over downtown (laughs) Deland. At least these people made an image that looked like something. Oh, wow, that's really great art. What is it? (laughs) If you have to say what is it, it's not great art. It's a three-year-old scribbling on a piece of paper in church. Why do I have to pay for that? Now, you say, well, things are a lot worse now than they were then. Where would you go to prove that? Well, the Bible. Well, yeah, but the Bible is written to people living then. If you're going to the Bible to get verses to preach against the horrible sins that are happening in your society, it's because they've always been happening. Look what was going on in Rome. Chapter 1. Verse number 29. Unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness. Somebody changed the channel. Covetousness, maliciousness. I don't want to watch that. Full of envy, murder, debate. I've already seen that. It's a rerun. Deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters. (laughs) That's the news channel. Haters of God. Despiteful, proud, boasters. There's a sports channel. Inventors of evil things disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, there's the government access channel, without natural affection, (laughs) there's the animal planet, Uh, (laughs) implacable, unmerciful. Do you see that list? Oh, things are so bad, they've never been this bad. They've always been this bad. Well, people are doing stuff now that they've never done before. They've always done this stuff. Here's what happens. This is true. You're unsaved. You're lost. You're in the world. You use their cuss words. You look at their dirty movies. You listen to their ungodly music. You wear their fashions. You don't think a thing of it. That's life. You get saved. God takes you out of darkness and puts you into light. He takes you out of death and He puts you into life. And then you turn and you look at the world and you say, Wow, it's never been this bad. Look how bad the world is. 
We've been telling you that for years. The world didn't get worse. You just got out of it so you could see it. What are you saying? I'm saying that if God took you back and put you in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, you would think you were in New Orleans in February. If God took you back in time and put you in Rome in the, in the first century A.D., you would think you were in Atlanta. People are people. They need the gospel. Where they hear the gospel, they get saved. Save people are people. When they are instructed and taught from the epistles, their lives improve dramatically. So we take these things, we apply them to our hearts, we live by them. We don't try to come up with some new emerging modern mega something or other because, you know, you've got to appeal to man the way he is today. He is what he's always been. Be confident. The Bible will work. It's always worked. It'll always work. All right, so when the gospel gets to Rome, there's a large Jewish population there. And as we said, we don't know how the church was planted there, but we know it consisted of both Jewish and Gentile converts. And we'll, we'll see that as we read through the book. There was always tension and jealousy between these two groups. This is evidenced by the content of Acts, Galatians, and Ephesians. The Jews regarded, uh, the Jew regarded his nation as favored of God. And owing to the special blessings the Lord had given them, they insisted that Gentile converts not only become Christians, but Jews also. Not uncommon in our day. For their part, the Gentiles viewed the Jews with contempt thinking them narrow-minded bigots who thought more of form and ceremony than of God. And while there was a measure of truth in the views both groups held to the other, each missed the underlying cause of the other's shortcomings. They had religion, but they didn't know the Lord. Come on, you're pro- Listen, if you've got a personality problem or a temper problem or a pride problem or a selfishness problem or... A, it's not because you're Italian or Puerto Rican or from Ecuador. It's because you're from Adam. <laughs> These men say, well, you know, I'm German. Germans have a temper. <laughs> well, I, who doesn't have a temper? It has nothing to do with your nationality. It has to do with your, your, your flesh. After salvation, these groups so different by nature and culture, were now members of one body with no difference between them according to God. But this was either not understood by them or they clung to their national pride and identity in spite of it. Romans sets before the Jew and the Gentile salvation by Christ in its relation to each of them and shows that both groups were equally under condemnation that's Romans 1, Romans 2, that both groups require the same Savior and the same salvation and that both groups enjoy the same benefits once they are saved. It's the same today, or it should be. With this in mind, we see the Holy Spirit explaining why the Jew is lost in Romans 1 why the Gentile is lost in Romans 2, and then sitting them both down and showing them that they sin alike in Romans 3. We are then shown how all who believe are saved, Romans 3, 21 through chapter 5, and how all saved people are given victory over what they are by nature in Romans chapter 6 and verse 8. Perfect. And if all we had was Romans 1 through 8, it would be the easiest book in the Bible to read and study and preach. But right in the middle of it is Romans 9 through 11. 
And strangely enough, people read Romans 1, 2, and 3, and it's about Jews and Gentiles. And they read Romans 5, 6, and 7, uh, and 7 uh, 5, 4, 5, 4, and 5, and it's about Jews and Gentiles getting saved. And they read Romans 6, 7, and 8, it's about saved people getting victory over the flesh and living in the Spirit. And then they get to Romans 9 through 11, and all of a sudden it's not about Jews and Gentiles, it's about the elect from before the foundation of the world. Except it's not. Why would those three chapters be about somebody other than who the first eight chapters were about? The book of Romans shows that having left the law did not leave anyone closer to salvation than not having, or having the law, left no one closer to salvation than not having the law, since no one performed its precepts. You know, better off having the law than the Gentile who didn't have the law if you don't keep the law and you didn't keep it. It takes us back to show that Abraham's justification was before the law and without the law and that David found righteousness not by his works but by faith. Hallelujah. It instructs the Jewish converts to consider the law as dead and to see themselves married to another. And that what the law could not do, owing to the weakness of man, God had done by sending his Son. Well, what about the entire Old Testament? We're just going to throw that away. That's Romans 9 and Romans 10 and Romans 11. God's still going to keep his promises that he made back in the Old Testament, but he's doing something else right now. And when he finishes with this, we'll go right back to that and pick up where we left off and get it done. We'll get there. In a few years. <laughs> Romans 9, 10, 11. They're taught to treat each other with love, kindness, and respect in Romans 12 through 16. So, here's how you divide the book. Easy to divide Romans. Chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 3, verse 23 shows the condition of the lost man and explains why he is lost. We will learn what men do because they are lost. It's an indictment of the whole human race. Romans 1 states that all men are without excuse before a holy God and gives the reasons why. Since evening precedes morning, doesn't it? Genesis 1, the evening and the morning with the first day. The Holy Spirit must first confound the pride of the Jews and the Gentiles before he can bring them to saving faith. This is why the modern gospel that doesn't preach Christ died for our sins is not the gospel. Why do I need to be saved if I have nothing to be saved from? God loves me just like I am and he's not mad at me. (laughs) I don't need the gospel. So Romans 1 and 2 brings the whole human race in, sits them down and says, this is why this is why I'm going to uh, put you in eternal torment. God does this by showing the Jews that they had miserably and consistently broken their own law, thereby forfeiting all the privileges which they could have enjoyed had they been obedient. He then shows the Gentiles that they were a degraded people, guilty of the basest crimes and the lowest idolatry, after he leaves neither group any ground for hope, He then offers them pardon through the merits of Jesus Christ. Now look at Romans 3 just for a minute. He just destroys these idolaters in chapter 1. And then the Jew gets this big smile on his face. And in chapter 2, God says, well, you're inexcusable. (laughs) You don't keep the law. Chapter 3, what advantage then hath the Jew? (laughs) Doesn't do you any good at all. Verse 10, Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. How about that? Verse 22. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, here's what's really great. We believe every jot and tittle of the Bible. (laughs) Believe it all. 
chapter 1, you're lost because God put his, a knowledge of his power and Godhead in your heart from birth and you didn't want it. You said, God, get out of my heart. I want a statue. Romans 1 goes on to say you want the statue, not God, because you want to sin and the statue won't condemn you for it. Chapter 2, the Gentiles know what's going on in their heart. They just push it aside and pursue their flesh. Chapter 3, the Jew thinks he's got an in with God because he's got some covenant promises back there from the Old Testament. But the Lord says, that doesn't matter about you as an individual, you're lost. So, three chapters and, well, two chapters and 23 verses of the third chapter, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost. But watch this. Watch, watch how much hope God puts into something you just zip right past. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, period, with a comma underneath it. You know what a period is? It's stop, I'm through with that thought. You know what a comma is? Slow down, I've got something more to say about that. You know what God said? You are lost, period. But don't despair. I've got something more to say about that. What a blessing. That semicolon is is a blessing. It's a period. Stop. I'm done. That's all i got to say about why you're lost. But it's not all I've got to say about you, comma, keep going. I'm going to tell you how you get saved. Thank God. So when you're witnessing, we say, well, you know, all of a sudden comes over the glory of God. And we flip right over to the next verse. Pause there a little while. You are lost, but you don't have to stay lost. God's done something for you. He's done something about it. Hallelujah. Okay, so Romans 3, 24 to 5, 21 is probably the most blessed section in all of Scripture to the spiritually seeking or spiritually minded man. Here we read that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. We get that in the Gospels. But without Romans, those things are just history. In Romans, we learn how Jesus' death and resurrection apply to the believer today. Romans 3.24 to 5.21, the Holy Spirit explains what the work of Christ means to the sinner. Romans 6 through 8, show the condition of the saved man. If God has saved both Jew and Gentile by His grace, redeemed them, made a propitiation for them, and justified them... What will be the outcome in their day-to-day life? There will be one. But it will depend upon your relationship to the indwelling Holy Spirit. In Romans 6 through 8, we learn of the opposition raised by the flesh, by sin, and by a failing physical body, and how one may be victorious in all these trials. Few portions of Scripture have been more misunderstood and have fueled more falsehood than Romans 9 through 11. Simply stated, these chapters answer the question which would naturally arise from the truth that there is equality of Jew and Gentile in Christ. That is, did not God choose the Hebrews and give them superior light and blessings and promises? If that's true, are these things done away with? Have they been taken from Israel and given to the church? Or were they never real or literal promises? Romans 9 through 11 addresses that. It forms a parenthesis. In the Old Testament, God called out Abraham. He called Abraham's children out of Egypt. He brought them into the land of promise and established their kingdom. The first 39 books of the Bible are occupied almost entirely with the Hebrews. Large portions of the Gospels still have Abraham's heirs as their focal point, as does much of the book of Acts. Then suddenly, God doesn't seem to be dealing with a Jew anymore. Well, you got, come on, Lord, you've got to explain that. You can't just drop them. Or you'll end up with Presbyterians thinking they've replaced Israel. Or white Baptists thinking they're God's chosen people and, and they 
was supposed to get an army together and conquer Zion, wherever that is. D.C., New Orleans, Memphis, who knows. This week I was reading some fella, and, and I thought I was going to get some information on the restoration of Israel, and his pamphlet was on the restoration of Israel, and it was the pilgrims coming over on the Mayflower and restoring Israel in North America. And, but I'd never heard this before from a, from a Calvinist who deny, he, he denies Jesus Christ ever coming back to earth. He's not coming back to earth. The church is going to take over the world through white men in North America. <laughs> anyway, he said, if you have any questions at all about election or God or the Bible, dial Romans 911. I never, I never heard that before. <laughs> you go to Romans 9 through 11, and that's supposed to be your, your answer for everything. Uh, anyway, Romans 9 through 11, if you don't change the words to mean something they don't say, tells of God's present and future plans for Israel. We see that he's not finished with them. He's just shifted his attention to the church for a period of time. I don't want to dwell on this tonight. We can't dwell on this tonight. But let let me just say something. If you're reading a passage of Scripture and it says, God has chosen to give Israel the land. Why do you only change one word in that sentence? If Israel's not Israel, if Israel is Idaho... What's God? If Israel is, I don't know, your, your secret shotgun club in the woods, <laughs> what's the land? See, once you change one word in the Bible, you, it's a domino effect. You've got to keep changing words to, to make your theory or your theology somehow seem biblical, but you can't make it seem biblical because you have to alter the Bible to set it forth. Best thing to do is just leave the Bible alone and, and believe what it says. There's things in there I can't understand. Well, that just proves whoever wrote it smarter than anybody that reads it. That doesn't mean you change it into something you can understand. You know, it's, people, are, people who don't believe the Bible, they, they, have, they have a really hard time. They come to something in the Bible that's too hard to understand, and they say, well, I can't understand that. I've got to change it into something else. Then they come to something in the Bible they can't understand, like Revelation, where in the end times their weapons are spears and bows and arrows, and they say, well, I can't, that can't be that. That's too easy to understand. Why not just leave it alone? Just study the book and believe the book and enjoy the book. All right, the last five chapters of Romans tell how God expects us to live. Information on our relationship to other Christians, our relationship to the government, our relationship to the things of this world, and our relationship to other churches is set before us. It's very practical material. So let's finish up with something that's not in Romans, but it summarizes Romans very well. Come to Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter 2. And verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That's Romans 1 through 5. (coughs) Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that's Romans 6, 7, and 8. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's Romans 12 through 16. So that's what we'll have in the book. It's a big book. It's a long book. It's a detailed book. But I, I want you, if, 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 if we can leave with one thing tonight, I want you to leave with this belief, because it's true. The preaching of the Word of God to lost people 
in a city like yours, in a day when their carnality was on full display, reached the hearts of sinners and souls were saved. And when the teaching of the New Testament doctrines reached a place as corrupt and full of idolatry and sin as Rome, it changed lives where people would hear it and believe it. We don't need to give up. And we don't need new methods and tactics. We just need to preach and teach the Word of God. And let the Lord do what He's always done. Uh, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for introducing us to this book of Romans. And Lord, we ask and pray that you would help us, uh, not just tonight, but as we study it throughout the coming months and and on out into the future. uh, Lord, to allow you to work in our hearts and accomplish your purposes in our lives. And we'll thank you for it very, very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.